Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I am Caleb Nauer, and this is Tacos Alex E. What's going on, Tacos? Hey, what's happening, Caleb? Tacos. Yeah, that's that's probably like the, the second most popular nickname that I've had for people who can't pronounce my name. It's either Taco with a T or Paco with a P. So I like Taco. Taco works for me. I like tacos, so why not? Tacos are awesome. So <laughs> They are. And this was easier than trying to come up with Greek names. I think I was getting burnt out on that. So it's either that or Papa So uh, we'll have to come up with a new bit at some point. Okay. You do that, man. You do that. <laughs> so what's our call to action as we our start this action. podcast? Always, always make sure you like listen or subscribe to our youtube channel or anywhere you download your current podcasts on apple spotify and google cool cool well let's go ahead and get to the chase here and get into the the heart of the conversation so we've been having a lot of these chats with customers recently seems like there's been an uptick for sure i think because it's fall starting to cool down people are thinking about expansion in the warmer regions of the country Definitely. um so what i want to talk about today is growth and migration to horns uh what for Wiss that their networks are growing or maybe they're a little uh horn curious or horny curious <laughs> and they're like you know i bought a couple i tried it but but what do we do and we, we see a lot of these entry questions pop up on Wiss talk we get emails and stuff like that and we always like to hop in because once you figure out some of the nuances and stuff of how the horns work how to deploy and how to start deploying the horns in your network it's relatively straightforward but we always like to just jump in there show people link calculator and stuff like that and give some tips and hints so they get started the easiest way possible so i figured this was a good uh venue or format or whatever we want to call it to kind of continue that conversation today along with some other little hints and nuggets that we've picked up along the way yeah without a doubt without a doubt there are i mean multiple ways of doing it i mean there's kind of your you know really there's like almost two different methods right obviously you know you have the totally horny tower which is nothing but horns and that's typically your you know new build whatever you just know you're going to use horns so you deck it out but the most popular by far even today with is how powerful or how uh popular our platform has become is the hybrid installation right where you still have some sectors or some other type of antenna technology uh, on your tower and then you also have our horns working in conjunction with uh, those uh, patch array sectors or whatever. I mean, I've, I've seen some people build out towers using dish antennas because they wanted something really narrow, right? So whatever it is, essentially the hybrid is, you know, the legacy patch array type stuff and horns, or you just got the full straight out, nothing but horns on the tower. So yeah, that hybrid approach where people sort of start backfilling in uh, things like that, I think is, is gotten, you know, it's really popular and it's kind of funny. Like sometimes this your you know, average Joe whips getting started a few hundred subs and they're like, you know, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of congestion or, or the more customers I add, you know, the, the quality is going down or I can see my overall sector performance is going down or, Hey, I put up a bunch of APs and now I'm creating my own noise. So they, they kind of go, okay, I see the noise. It's either my competitor or, you know, a lot of times they're causing their own noise. And they're like, well, we know that RF elements helps with noise, but we're not entirely sure how. So, you know, that's where a lot of these introduction conversations come from. And they're like, well, how do I, how do I start adding horns? to my tower so yeah so i think typically when you know we we talk to a new customer who's kind of curious about the technology kind of understands what's going on they understand what they're seeing uh, online as far as you know what our horns bring to the table there's still you know for for a newcomer especially somebody who's new and green totally to the industry it's like well you know how do i how do i make this work how do i justify and how do i know so i mean like a, a typical uh, type first time thing is just like just buy a horn, right? So I, I usually tell customers, find your most overloaded tower, right? Whatever it is, or your most overloaded sector, let's say, or the one that's underperforming in, in some way, whether it's due to noise or you just have too many customers on it. And just take like, for example, our 30 degree symmetrical horn, just get a radio, point it down kind of the middle or, or out towards an angle, like maybe there's a, a cluster of customers, you know, on the edge of this one sector or something like that. Just point it out there, Take those customers off the sector, load them onto the horn-enabled radio, and and then you'll just see that the night and day difference. And, and that really helps a lot because it also now reduces the load on that current 
AP that was on the sector. So the performance kind of goes up for that guy. And then, of course, the ones that are on the horn get, you know, the, the great performance you see from our antennas with that radio system. And therefore, you, you kind of start to get the idea of how this works and how you can start splitting those wider antennas up into more narrow horns, you know. Yeah, it's always fun when people are like, hey, I moved these 10 customers over to this this horn and, you know, the signal levels are about the same or maybe a little bit better. But what I noticed were the SNRs jumped through the roof and now all my modulations, I went from 4X, 6X, just sort of these semi muddy connections to now it's 8X, 8X and it's fantastic. And how does it work? Is this magic? We're like, no, it's not magic. It's engineering. You know, we're cutting out a lot of that self-generated noise from yourself on the same tower. We've cut out the side load noise and, you know, all those benefits of what horns give you versus the sloppy sector approach. Yeah. I mean, there's really a lot more to, uh, you know, the issues that you have when you have really wide sectors, right. Or, or sectors in general, because we're, we're talking again, you know, about patch array technology versus horn antenna technology. But, you know, as you move to the edge of the sector, you know, the gain starts to drop off. That's normal. Even on our antennas, that's your three DB and six DB drop off. So the gain gets lower. So typically, uh, the users that are on the edge of a sector have, you know, lower modulation rates than the ones that are kind of in a sweet spot towards the centerish part of your antenna pattern. But the other bigger problem is with patch ray antenna technology is that the vertical and horizontal uh, beam patterns aren't perfectly matched, right? So you might have vertical polarity that's like, let's say, 80 degrees wide, and your your horizontal might be 100 degrees wide, and they, they call that a 90 degree sector, as an example. So it's in these outer regions and the outer parts of the coverage area for that particular antenna is where you get those chain mismatch errors, right? So this is another huge thing. So not only do you have lower gain, which means probably lower signal and lower SNR, but now you have chain mismatch on top of that. So when you when you really put all those things together, I mean, it just drops your modulation rate way down to what it could be, even if you have what you would consider a decent signal. So the horns really correct all of that stuff because our beams are perfectly matched in vertical and horizontal polarity. And the gain for both those polarities are the same, no matter where you are in the beam. It, it drops off, but vertical and horizontal gain at this point um, you know, is the same regardless. So, so you get much better connections. Yeah, the frequency stability across the whole band as well, you know, is, is really beneficial. So, and it's when that, that light clicks on, they see those modulations jump. You know, so many people fixate on just signal levels because it's the first thing you see when you put up a link and it's the easiest one to look at. But, you know, you're not going to have great performance unless you keep those modulation rates across the board high. Um so that's always a fun one or when people take their their first 90 and split it into three thirties, whether it's symmetrical or asymmetrical and they see the performance difference is fantastic. And we yeah. always tell people, you know, it can be overwhelming. They're like, well, you know, I don't want to put up a whole array. You know, it's, it's a lot of money and I got to have a lot of radios and a lot more cables and stuff. We're like, well, that's, that's totally fine. You know, sectors and horns can definitely live in the same place. And there's one of the big benefits of our system is it is so flexible. So, Again, maybe you've got a tower and 360 degrees of coverage, but maybe only, you know, the top 180 degrees is busy. You know, there's just some scrub or rural areas behind. Then, you know, move your move your sectors over around a little bit. You can throw your horns on the dense areas and just rock and roll with it for sure. Yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a fantastic point and something that uh, people often overlook because, you know, they they really, you know, this industry, you know, the legacy history of this industry has gotten people to kind of look at their tower deployments and the standard geometries that uh, these antenna manufacturers have put out. Three 120s, four 90s, six 60s, and, and, and beyond. And, you know, what our antennas bring, because we have so many different beam angles uh, available, is the ability to go ahead and mix and match all those different beam angles. So why do you have to have, you know, all 30s? You don't have to have 1230s. You can have, you know, 260s and 630s, right? You can have, you know, 390s and 330s to make your 360s. So you, you build the coverage where you have it. So, so try and open up your mind a little bit and start thinking about outside of those standard geometries and, and realize this is why we gave the industry so many different beam profiles to, to choose from. Because again, like Caleb mentioned, you might have the south facing side of your tower have nobody on it, right? So 
why would you put 330s there and and put over capacity when you really don't need it, right? So so really picking the right uh, horn for the job, mixing, matching uh, those different beam angles to be where your customers actually are because you don't want to transmit or receive from directions where you don't have to. For sure, for sure. And then you got to think about what your radio load is going to be too, you know? I mean, you know, from, you ask one of our sales guys, you know, they're like, oh, you, you know, you, you would look, we would love to sell 12 by 30 across the whole band, right? And so with the radio manufacturers and everyone else, but you know, it's not necessary in a lot of cases. And you've got to think about how many customers am I really going to put on a particular sector and radio? So if you've got a 90 degree spread and you're never going to have more than 10 folks on that because there's nobody else there, then you know you don't need to split them up really heavily. But if you've got, I don't know, 60, 70 subs on a 90 degree sector, then yeah, split it in the 330s. Um, if those subs are out further and you need the extended gain, maybe they're not, maybe they're all really close. And then we use the symmetrical, you know, 60s or whatever it may be. So we do get that question a lot. They're like, why are there so many horns? And it's, you know, it's tools in the toolbox approach and giving you the flexibility to deploy in the most efficient way possible. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, that's, I think that's, Probably, you know, I would say like the number two issue when you first kind of jump into horns, right? So the, the first one is they're very precise. How do I aim them? They're worried about, you know, the drop off is really steep on the edges, which is how you get that noise isolation. So they, they kind of overthink like, oh, if I'm two degrees off and then those patterns don't line up, I'm going to have a dead zone. Doesn't work like that, right? So RF continues to go. It just degrades as you go beyond that point. Ours just degrade faster and that's how you get that, that noise isolation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, again, you know, understand that relationship and, and how that work and, and, and doing it for the first time is really how you do, how you learn, right? So once you do it, you'll get it, you know, going beyond that point. The second one is, well, how do I know which one is the right one? Because you have so many, you know, and again, there's, there's so many different types of use cases and we see WISPs use, you know, these horns in, in different ways all the time. Like, you know, our low gain 90 degree symmetrical horn is still like a champ for micro pops, right? But people don't think that. You know, they still think they want all this gain and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we see people kind of, you know, uh, go with the higher gain 90 and use a lot of down tilt to kind of dumbing down that gain right at the horizon. It's like, well, well, why bother? Right. You should now, you know, if it's going to grow and your service area is going to go off further then sure, because over time you could just tilt it up, tilt it up, tilt it up to grow out your distance. So from that you know, aspect, it makes sense on using asymmetrical over symmetrical. But for the most case, if you're building like really high density, uh, you know, lots of co-located APs in some geographical area, you know, the 90 degree uh, symmetrical horn is just, it's just fantastic for a mile or less on, on most radio platforms, specifically 256 QAM or below. For sure, man. Yeah, for sure. So now when we have a lot of these conversations, we end up basically telling folks, look, there's a few things you definitely need to understand before you start rolling. I mean, you can go buy a horn, throw it up willy nilly. And if you've been doing this a little bit, you're going to figure it out. But we provide tools and information to help you make this easier. So our good friend, Link Calculator. Link, Link Calculator. calculator. Yay! <laughs> so there's a couple of things we, you know, we, we harp on this all the time, right? But the two or three main important things with the Link Calculator is one, it gives you what your coverage area is going to be for your desired MCS rays. So, you know, most people, when they think about coverage area, they're like, oh, 90 degrees and we'll put this 90 here and it goes on forever. And it, it does in theory, but, you know, after a while, you just don't have any usable game. So... Put in multi CPE mode, turn on MCS 987, pick your CPE, your gain that you're using for most of your CPEs. Maybe you're using a high gain, you know, maybe you're using mid gain or whatever it may be, and look at what your coverage area is. And it's really important that you understand where your edges are. And it's important that you understand what your max usable range is for that given antenna. You know, maybe if it's really short, you map it with symmetrical and it's fine. Maybe you're like, mm, these signal levels aren't quite where they need to be. So let's, you know, go to maybe an asymmetrical or go to a smaller beam width antenna to get that increased gain. So that's really important. Uh, the second thing is important is down tilt. You know, people get hung up on down tilt a lot, especially when you're coming from sectors to horns. 
Uh, your sector antennas have a much narrower elevation cut, so you've got to be really careful. And most of them have down tilt built into it, electrical down tilt and stuff. And people get a little hung up on that. You know, a lot of times with these horns, their elevation cuts are a lot wider, so you don't quite have to be as sensitive. But there are ways that you can use down tilt. You know, maybe you want to cut the noise down on the horizon. You can play it with that. Or you're wanting to focus on a very tight area that's right by the tower, then you can play with the down tilt and our tools will show you what that coverage area looks like as you adjust the down tilt down. So that's really important. Uh, and it's important to look at what your modulation rates are for the client. Think about now and in the future, right? So if you're going with mid range clients, but you're like, well, maybe I'm looking to move to high range clients and I can expand my cells, or maybe I'm trying to reduce costs. And I want to use smaller cells, or I've got a lot of density or thinking for the future. You know, there's a bunch of really sexy radios coming up in the near future, whether they're AX based, whether they're, you know, they're all going to be running these higher modulation rates. Um, more advanced timers and stuff. So now we've got to start thinking about what the density is now versus what it could be down the road. And if you have the opportunity to maybe deploy a little heavier saying, Hey, if I've got to clang and bang up this tower and move these things around, well, let me plan for putting maybe a few more horns or splitting it. So I've got more flexibility with the smaller beam patterns and the higher gains and then utilizing the twist port architecture, moving to another radio is a simple, you know, click and twist. So it's so easy to do that. Our horns are agnostic to the radio tech behind it as frequency tune. So, you know, if you're, if you're going through the effort to, to move a bunch of stuff around, then maybe plan for the future like that plan for using these higher modulation radios. And, you know, you, you, you pay a little bit more for the hardware, but if you look at what your costs are to move all this stuff around and downtime and everything else, you know, it maybe pays for itself down the road. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't really uh, say enough about the twist port ecosystem and how under under understood <laughs> is that the right way to say it <laughs> misunderstood maybe uh that that it really is and and the benefits that you get from our twist port ecosystem right so it's not just this really cool simple way to connect and disconnect your radios uh from the antennas but you know the the ability um, to switch radio platforms, the uh, ability to, you know, again, maintain your system, upgrade your system and, and do other things is really, really, uh, really fantastic. It's a, it's a great thing. It gives you so much flexibility. And again, the standard that we've built, you know, between whether you're going from, you know, an ultra dish to an ultra horn to asymmetrical horn to symmetrical horn as well, as long as the antenna, you know, our antenna that you use is twist port enabled. That twist port adapter and radio you have will work with any of those things. So, you know, you can take what used to be, let's say, a radio on a twist port that was now a low end access point, and you don't need to throw that away. You could just put that on an ultra dish and turn it into a CPE or turn it into a, you know, a mid range, mid speed uh, backhaul for something, right? So it's really uh, reusable. And again, just a lot of flexibility there. A lot of flexibility. You know, it's kind of funny. I had a question yesterday um, from one of our channel reps. And he was like, yeah, he was asking questions about one of the V2 models of something. And he was like, what are the differences? And, you know, where was the mount that it mainly changed? And we're going on about that. And he was like, yeah, my customer said that he thought the twist port changed. And y'all were changing around the twist port. So we're like, mm, no. Like, the twist port is like the main uh like backbone as to what this whole system is, because we want to think for the future and give you that flexibility to deploy all sorts of radios, you know, down the road when they're ready for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, here's something that's not really related to us specifically, but I see people burn up all the time on this and really hurt themselves is not mapping where your clients are. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Well, and it's, it's easy when you get started, man, like you've got so much going on and you're like, well, I know this customer's on the sector. They pay their bills. That's all I need to know. Right. But when you start talking about doing these migrations, you really need to know physically where they are. So let's say they're connected to a 90 degree sector and maybe they're on the edge and now you're moving to two sixties or you're moving to three thirties or whatever it may be. You need to know which sector that that new, that client is going to connect to as you transition them. Or maybe, maybe 
that client is actually behind the sector. You've got this sloppy sector with these sloppy back lobes, and they're pretty close, and your tech were just like, saw an AP connected it, you know, whatever. They don't know what's going on. You know, you might be connected to the back of that sector, and then when you go and swap it out, uh, you have no more connection because we don't have back lobes on our antenna. So there's a lot of other benefits of mapping. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, you know, the simple way is just making KMZs in Google Earth. Just drop the client and be done with it. You've got um, Link Planner does mapping a lot of your billing tools and this is a conversation we had a while ago talking about billing tools you know a lot of these billing and crm tools don't do just billing you know one of the important things that they do is the mapping feature and showing you which clients are connected to which sector and which tower that's really important we were working with a guy the other day that we were showing us all this i'm like this is really cool because you have all this information broken down at a granular level and it just gives you so many tools to work with as you grow so yeah. For love, Pete, make sure you know where your CPEs are because it'll yeah. burn you if you don't. Oh, and I've I've had many, many, many conversations with Wisps <laughs> uh, that have went you know to horns, and you know they're they're like, hey, there's just no connection. This is horrible. You know this stinks. And I'm like, look, I'm telling you, you're probably connected to the back of that antenna, and now you're you got no connection. It's like there's no way. Blah 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 do a truck roll, find out like, yeah, they're on the backside. So it's really important. <laughs> and, and a good point you bring up, Caleb, for newcomers who are trying horns for the first time and when they want to transition to this, <clears throat> really there, there are a, a few steps uh, and things that you should really think about. You know, we, we talked about the whole planning thing. You know, think about your growth, where this tower is going to go in the future so you can pick the right horn uh, for the job, for the initial thing. But also, yeah, definitely knowing where your customers are before, because not even just the backside, right, but even the edge, because uh, sector antennas are extremely sloppy and the bleed off is extremely low. Yeah, you could still be on the side of a 90 or a 60, but it really be at like 90 or 120 degrees out, right? So mm -hmm. when you put up a horn in its place, it's definitely going to drop off because going 30, deg 30 degrees past its spec beam angle is a, is a hard, hard, hard <laughs> drop off there. So, so yeah, so it's not just, you know, is it as obvious as connecting to the back of a sector? It's not. It's also how far past that initial 90 and, uh, you know, or whatever that antenna may be uh, that you're connected to because you can be far past that. Yeah, there's a lot of where, you know, that sort of dead reckoning. We're like, well, no, Jim Bob's connected to this one. Nah, he's over there somewhere, right? Well, as you get more granular and more precise with our horns, these details really matter. So... So yeah, this hybrid approach migration is really popular. And then of course you've got the option of just basically building out a new tower and go all horns on a new tower. You know, that's a popular way. They're like, look, we have this conversation a lot. We've got these new builds coming up. We want to try horns here in a greenfield environment. What do we do now? It can be a little overwhelming. You know, a lot of the pictures we throw up are these uh, co-location miracles or these really <laughs> sexy pictures where you've got like 30 horns on a tower. I mean, it's super awesome. Right. But they're like, uh, I don't know about all this so you don't have to start that way so especially when we added the asymmetrical and the asymmetrical 90 right that is definitely the easiest way to do a new greenfield tower deployment with the least amount of expenditure you're going to get the ranges that are really good you're gonna get those 90 degree coverage areas so you've got your ABAB channel planning you got four radios and then you can build as that thing grows and you add more and more people to then you can go in there later and split sectors or move sectors around or add another array of sectors um, or horn as you want so it gives you a lot of flexibility so don't 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 think you have to go out there and put 30 antennas on a tower i mean if you want to we can we'll definitely take your money <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you don't have to go that way or maybe maybe you're just covering 180 degrees put two of them up so it's a really straightforward approach and all the things that we said about link planner and uh the link calculator and all these things still apply it just gives you a, a cleaner way to start you definitely want to think too about what your power distribution looks like, your data distribution as these grow, because they run people run into that a lot. They're like, I'm going to go from four radios to twelve or whatever it may be. 
And they're like, oh man, running all these cables up here really sucks. So, you know, those are some other sort of growth things that we talk about that's not really necessarily directly related to us, but it's in general. So things like knowing where your CPUs are, having a power plan, uh, making sure that you've got enough power and you've got enough room in your cabinets and stuff like that. Those are definitely some important considerations that we, we see people run into all the time. Definitely, definitely. And the, uh, I mean, you bring, you bring up a, a good point about, you know, how overwhelming it can seem for a lot of new customers who haven't used it. Cause like you said, they're so used to seeing these really high density deployments, 12, 24, 30 horns on a tower. And, and they, they, you know, automatically think, you know, that now they're starting to see a lot of people using ultra horn for point to multi point. So you'll see, you know, six ultra horns out there just splitting those thirties into fifteens and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so they, they make those kind of, you know, uh, you know, offhanded, you know, uh, assumptions that I got to put up a, crap ton of these things and it's really not it's really not the case right that's what you can build up to so you don't have to like forklift your tower either right they think well i'm gonna have to take down all these sectors to put up horns i'm gonna be down for two three days and what if the climbers don't show up i could be down for a week what are do my customers and it, it doesn't work that way either right so you know you'll you'll go ahead and you'll you'll put your you know like if you're replacing a 90 let's just say to make the math easy you put up you know your 330s you get your customers over onto those new 30s and you're talking a five second switch over and then you decommission uh, that 90 degree the other really big thing is of course, once you start seeing a lot of access points in the tower, you just start thinking a lot more channels. And yes, the, obviously the numbers do work that way, but the amount of channel reuse that you get with GPS sync and our horns helps bring that down. But the other big thing that most customers really don't understand is your channel size. I find WISPs every mm. day mm. that are running much wider channels and they really need to. And the reason that they're running these wider channels is because obviously 20 megahertz is probably not enough. Let's just say as the example, you have the towers either overloaded or you're selling packages that are really fast. So you need more speed. So they'll bump it up to a 40 megahertz channel, which makes perfect sense if you were efficiently using that 40 megahertz channel. And what we find very often is that going from 20 to 40 should double your speed, but it doesn't because again, the modulation rates are, are down. You have mixed clients at further, you know, far out and close in and all these other reasons why the radio underperforms to begin with. And what we find is a lot of customers, when they go from a sector to a horn, they're typically able to go from a 40 megahertz channel down to a 20 megahertz channel and deliver the same service that they were before because we're using that 20 megahertz efficiently. So in theory, taking down one antenna frees up two channels. So, so you get, you get the channel reuse. You'll go from larger channel sizes down to more narrow channel sizes, which would give you and free up more spectrum. So, the math works out. Of course, this is not, you know, 100% every time, but there are benefits to the horns that you really don't know until you use them. Because also, uh, the other thing that WISP say is, a, well, I look at my spectrum scan and I just see the whole spectrum across the board is, is all, you know, all taken. And again, that's because you're looking at your spectrum through the eyes of your sloppy antenna, right? So once you put a horn up there, you'll see, again, you know, stuff that was unusable before becomes decent, let's say. Stuff that was decent is highly usable. You'll see gaps open up and, and other things that happen once you use an antenna that's extremely precise and has no side lobes like our horn antenna. So, so don't be scared about, you know, I don't have enough spectrum or you think you don't have enough spectrum. Put up a horn, try it out, and then you'll see for yourself uh, what everybody else has been talking about. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that when I started doing this and started working with customers and, um, you know, we'd look and we're like, all right, here's my sector in a 40 meg channel, but they're all sloppy and all your clients are at poor modulation rates and then swap to a horn. Everything's 8X or 10X or whatever it may be. And I'm like, hey, you can drop it down to 20 and you're still getting much better performance. So that is definitely the unhidden gem of these transitions that people don't always necessarily see. So definitely. I mean, we could talk about this and talk and talk and talk. This is a lot of what we do in our day to day lives. But uh, I think we, you know, I we're think we got to, the main points. I think we got the main points out there for our listeners. Yeah, yeah. And we're always supposed to leave them wanting more, according to Hollywood or I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know who makes the rules. We break the rules all the time, so who cares? Rules. I don't care. What rules? So, 
Hey, if you guys want to continue talking about this topic, though, find us at Wispapalooza. We will be there. It's right around the corner, uh, and this is a great opportunity to have these conversations, see the equipment and everything else. Find us, too. If you, We're super easy to find. We're on all the Facebook forums. We're on our RF Elements pages, Caleb at RFElements.com, toss us at RFElements.com. Super easy to track down. We're more than happy to talk to you when you're in this learning phase or just in general. So... <laughs> Definitely. that's about all i got man you got anything you're looking forward to or no just a weekend as usual so uh that's about it for me yeah yeah it is 49 degrees last night and it's supposed to be upper 40s low 50s all weekend highs in the 70s and sunny so for north kakalaki this is amazing weather <laughs> so i'm getting all jumpy and everything else so yeah, yeah. all right man well i think we're going to ready call it a day Awesome, man. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Until next time, stay horny. All right, stay horny, y'all. <laughs>